This is a story called Migraine City. It's quite beautiful, actually. Like a distant thunderstorm suspended on the horizon, quietly lighting up the mindscape of a city as you drive towards it. Some of the lightning strikes are interesting in what one might consider as scientific exploration at first, but they soon become tiresome. The echoes, bursts of light become a little more intense, then a little more intense. I put my hand up to my eyes and press against both lids while pinching the top of my nose with my index finger and thumb to try and ease the pain that has already landed. There's an unusual aching on the eyeballs, one that only occurs during such events. This is how I know it is about to occur. Dad, do you have a five on you? The shock of the voice comes from the hallway. I ignore her at first. How, after all these years, she still doesn't realize what is going on is astounding. Lights are off. I am positioned on top of my bed in the fetal position, holding my head, and it's early evening. She shouldn't even be looking at me, let alone speaking sounds. Just a couple bucks? Mom is making eggs again for dinner. I want to get something delivered instead, please. Voice goes up several levels of decibels and octaves, something only a teenage girl can do on call. I find that sometimes if you ignore teenagers long enough, they go away. Dad! Not this time. Jasmine, goddammit. Do you not see what is going on here? My revolt makes the pain intensify. God, I just need five dollars. <sighs> she always threatens the F word. I will give her the F word. I will give it to her with off, or me, or my life. My wallet is on the dresser, fucking Christ. Or Christ. Jasmine's a junior in high school who wants out of the house so badly she constantly tweets her disgust at being part of such an ordinary family by taking daily selfies of herself living in her middle-class prison, usually with cleavage. She is smart, which hopefully will be of use for school instead of song lyric memorization at some point. And she is strong-headed. That will come in handy too, I suppose. She's like her mother. I create a helmet with my free arm by bracing myself for a possible crash landing, just as the stewardess in my spinning schizophrenic mind has instructed me to do over the intercom. I do this in hope the gesture will protect the inside and outside of my head from the blows that can occur, such as wildly jerking into the bedside lamp and gashing my forehead, for example. As an added benefit, and free of charge, a constant ringing sound begins. It's not a security alarm tone, but more of the cheap, righteous hotel alarm clock sound, clearly used so that no one will steal them, whining and increasing in volume like an approaching French ambulance. I accept that the tone is coming from inside me. I accept it like a bad marriage with kids. Not my marriage. I don't think, anyway. Or is my marriage good? I don't know. Someone or a squirrel, maybe even the wind, moves past the front door. I know this because the damn dog yelps and barks so loudly that I can feel my skull begin to crack and tear open. Lucy loves me. I don't know why she would do this to me. And she knows when I am going through this, because she stays away rather than lie next to me, as she does during my nap, or at night. But it's not Lucy's fault. The real question is, why no one puts a stop to it? Am I the only one who tells her to stop barking? Three of them in the house, and no one else hears this? Lucy finally puts it to rest. The pain hits a high, and I ride it for another five minutes until a damn television bellows into my awareness. I can't be sure, but someone is changing channels between an action-adventure movie with explosions every few minutes and the Spanish network. Why would they have the TV up so loud? Why the Spanish network? Whose side are they on? And the commercials. Forget it. I cover my ears with my arms just to keep from having visions of the Pillsbury Doughboy standing over me, giggling and stabbing downward with a bloody knife. But while I have my arms there, I go ahead and give the old brain holster a squeeze to see if it helps or hurts the cause. Answer? It hurts. A lot. Honey? My wife has been through so many of these. The fact she has even come near the bedroom during this is amazing. 
Do you want me to make you some eggs? I don't answer. Suzanne doesn't believe the severity of it, I swear. She never has. Anger builds up inside me. How dare her. After a minute, there are no other sounds, and I assume she's left. She thinks her headaches are just as bad, but she can function through them. She thinks I'm a weak, typical man. But she has no idea. The same goes for my co-workers who come up to me and tell me they're having a bad migraine. I laugh in their face. I say, no, you're not. You'd be on the floor writhing in pain right now. Any sound or light would send you to a vomit. Your feet would be wiggling in spasm-like movements. No, you have what is called a bad headache. The day Suzanne and I met was, at best, a one in a billion chance. Twenty years ago, I was riding the L and missed my stop for work because some guy I didn't know and had just met was telling me about Pearl Jam concert he'd just been to. When I jumped on the train coming back and took a seat, she was there next to me, minding her own business, reading Dylan Thomas. I leaned over to her and told her I loved Dylan Thomas. She looked up with a wry smile. I can't stand him. The exchange sent us into a big laugh, and we decided to share our numbers. I took her to dinner that weekend. We were married a year later. I started having episodes about five years after that. I've been through this hell so many times, yet surprisingly it brings no savvy for dealing with it. I even make the same mistakes, like opening my eyes. And this time when I do lift my eyelids, I immediately find the bathroom light was left on by someone, or who I will now refer to as the worst person in the world. Oh, and that little 40-watt LED energy saver I bought for eleven ninety nine at the hardware store? It has now become a supernova, shooting gamma and UV rays with bursts of white light straight into my already tender eyeballs, making the lightning strikes occur in my pounding bots at once greater for longer durations. I close my eyes immediately, but the light doesn't disappear right away. It takes several minutes. I'm convinced, though, I can still see it through my closed lids. Shooting, stinging pain is broken loose from the cranial region and runs down my neck, causing me to worry that there has been a traumatic injury that will paralyze me. I crawl up onto my knees but keep my face buried into the bed just to check. The acidic feeling in my throat feels close. Too close. As it rises, then disappears, getting a little higher each time. It rises, then disappears. I pause and wait. It rises, then disappears. I know I will need to make a decision soon. Use the children's bathroom or ours? This is a much more complex question than the three of them would ever realize, because the master beth- bedroom bathroom is small and had a strong toilet bowl cleaner smell. In contrast, the children's bath is closer to the excruciating sounds of the television downstairs, plus something else. I just can't remember at the moment, because another baseball bat hit to the back of the head sends me flying flat on the bed. I consider that the current event will never end, and the horror of that thought adds to the weight of the situation. And what if that did happen? I sense deja vu of the deja vu from the previous events, and things get surreal. These are the same questions you always ask yourself during these stupid things. But I play anyway, and think to myself, yes, I would absolutely kill myself if I had to live like this. On the other hand, maybe I would get used to it, says my other, more reasonable voice from the many personalities now forming in my conscience. Then I start to argue with myself on whether A, I would in fact kill myself, the answer is yes, and B, how it would be done because the possibilities are limited when under attack from such a malevolent force. I can barely make it out of the house under such extreme conditions. I could jump out the window, you'd think, but only being two stories up, it would be risky. I don't want to end up with a killer brain-eating headache and a broken hip. That would be beyond dumb. But that train of thought disappears because a grenade is suddenly exploded inside my brain and is followed by a running sledgehammer that is relentlessly driving down on the top back right section of my skull. The memory of the sledgehammer from the last event floats through on a cloud in the storm. That's when a voice sent from the devil sounds. Hey, Dad, can I get the car tomorrow night? I got a gal I want to take to the game. My son pops his head in the room. I can't see him, but I can feel the goofy look on his face. Oh, for shit's sake, these people know better than this. I want to yell, go away. But what comes out is... 
My son is lazy. Not in a good way. Inherently. And he is brilliant, but barely passes classes. He's also a gamer. You shouldn't have to remind someone that it is trash night for the thousandth time. It is on the same night every week. Or that you need to mow the yard or shovel the driveway. Or that you need to get up and go to work because it is 1 p.m. on Sunday, just like every goddamn Sunday. He is a senior in high school, and he thinks he is just going to keep rolling through life after graduation. He has no idea. Memory of the trapeze swinger I had sex with from Philadelphia 15 years ago after comforting her in the lobby when the power went out and the hotel occurs. She was so innocent, beautiful. Then for some inexplicable reason, I opened my eyes again. What are you doing? Swear words roll through the thunderclouds in my mind like banners strung behind a blimp. Fuck, shit, cock, balls, pussy, motherfucker. For just a brief second, I feel relief. So I immediately do it again. Dick, bitch, fuck, cunt, asshole, whore. But I stop because the second time doesn't bring me the same relief. I remember every inch of her body and face, that trapeze swinger. And how I instantly fell in love with her. The only downside was the shrieking during sex. The memory of her porn-like high-pitched calls during that long night makes me push my head harder into the bed. Damn it. This same memory of the shrieking acrobat has appeared in every previous event as well. Don't think about the screaming part next time, I tell myself. Next time? That thought makes me want to cry. Since I don't know where the controls are for that emotion currently, and the hurricane crashing... Against my brain, membrane has made it impossible for me to react on my own accord. I smile. This is the truth. In the middle of the nuclear attack, where millions of dream babies and fantasy women and children, including my own parents and my kids and the beautiful screaming acrobat, her name is Charlotte. Yes, yes, harder, please, she would yell. All vaporize and perish. And I smile. And it feels wrong on so many levels, but the guilt is shallow. It does nothing against the pain. Showing no signs of letting up, I decide to reach out to a higher authority. Hello? No answer. But God. I clasp my hands together under my forehead. If you are real, why would you do this to a person? Surely there are worse people out there than me. Is this punishment for Charlotte? or for parking in the handicapped spot, because I swear to God it was poorly marked, and I did not know it was handicapped space until I was already out of my car, which was too late, because Suzanne was waiting for the black beans for the chili she was making for my chili cook-off at work, and it would have been ruined had I not hurried. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy art hallowed. What kind of stupid shit is that? Oh, hell, maybe this is just survival of the fittest, and I'm supposed to die and make room for more fit people. And my wife, Suzanne, what about her? She doesn't even understand these episodes. She doesn't understand me anymore, period. Charlotte understood me. And it took her only one night. Was it a chance of a lifetime 15 years ago and I didn't chase it? The furnace kicks on from the left side of my head while a boxer speed bag punches my right side. I want to scream. But just having the thought of screaming makes it worse. I wish I could prove that fact to others, especially Suzanne, who only looks at me with a disbelieving smirk when I tell her that sound, as a thought, or a vision, can hurt. But it doesn't matter anymore, because not only do I not have a scientific background to do so, but I probably won't live through the night in either. Already having tried surrendering countless times in Noavell, I've become delusional with flashes of false hope, such as thinking if I tilt my head just so, and put my right arm just like so, and rub my right eyelid slowly counterclockwise, it feels as if, no, didn't work. Shit, fuck, cock, balls. Nope, not working either. I remember asking Charlotte if she ever came close to dying. She said she had once. She was per performing a move they called a birdie, and the catcher signaled, Hup! a little too early, according to her. When she came out of her stunt, she fired right at the guy like a cannonball, and her weight and momentum was much greater than usual when he caught her. The catcher's grasp wasn't good, though, as one hand was by the elbow and the other was on her wrist. And as they swung back towards the catcher's platform, the two of them broke off, sending her flying like an arrow parallel with the net below. But as her luck would have it, another catcher was climbing up the ladder to the 
of the platform, and he reached out his hand and caught her, pulling her into him. The crowd went crazy, thinking it was part of the show. Charlotte had to go back to the locker room after that, done for the day. She continued working as an acrobat, and was something I admired. Torture is the perfect word to describe the non-stop thrashing, brain-burning, and eyeball bruising that accompanies the lymph known pulsating. Fireworks exploding and constant hot, cold game where you sweat profusely even though your body is freezing game. You hold yourself, enduring the pain, and tell yourself you're as brave, valiant as the martyred hero William Wallace. Just as he faced his executioner and they racked and disemboweled him from the peasant crowd. Except if, instead of yelling freedom and lifting the spirits of an entire orphan nation, I can honestly admit right now and right here that I would sing like a canary if it would stop this hurt. Okay, yes, I did know that it was a handicapped parking space, and I also knew the clerk gave me more chance than I should have received the other day and did nothing about it, and I admit I pretended to be asleep, so my wife would have to let the dog out at 3 a.m., and I sometimes ignore the overly full trash can in the kitchen when I don't feel like taking it out, and I once ran down to the corner for cigarettes while my baby was napping, and anything I did in college doesn't count at all because those five years plus the two buffer years after... I believe is protected under some sort of college diplomatic immunity Geneva clause, and when the kids are out of high school, Susan and I will let each other go so we can be happy with someone else because we really aren't soulmates. Oh yeah, that would really rally the masses. If anyone hasn't noticed yet, the entire event takes on the five stages of grief. Well, four, n never acceptance. And I am hitting anger. That is enough, I say inside my head. This is complete bullshit. I yell internally, causing pulsations on each side of the noggin. I rise up through the blurriness and strike the pillow with my fist with such a force that, yeah, it dies. I did it. I killed the pillow. And it is good because it deserved it. That pillow sucked. It wasn't the source of the agony, mind you. And that doesn't go away. But it feels right. I roll over and face the ceiling to yell at God some more with my new confidence. But immediately regret rolling over as new pain surfaced that I had yet felt. So I just lie there, unable to do anything about it. Then the feeling of being held hostage by an evil spirit causes me to yell, Demon be gone! And instantly I am disappointed with myself. Not from the fact that the effort failed, but from the realization that I've used the exorcist strategy for every event with no success. I wonder what Charlotte does now, as I always do during these things. I slowly open my eyes, and God damn it, why did I do that again? And I stop yelling inside my mind because it makes the pain worse. And again, I consider how it is even possible. So I yell again to test that hypothesis of internal sounds causing pain. Yes, I internally scream again, causing the pain to increase. I call myself an idiot, and immediately an argument ensues between all of the personalities now unleashed in the cabin. One voice says he can't be expected to make good decisions while enduring such wrath. The other replies that the first is an idiot. Third voice says that if he makes it out of this alive, he will be a better person for it. But also, yes, the first voice is an idiot. The group laughs. You smile. Does Suzanne even still love me? That is a real question. I questioned whether she had an affair the same year I met Charlotte the acrobat. I was ready to leave her then. But she became pregnant with Jasmine. Maybe Jasmine isn't mine. I ask this every time. A shot of pain so overwhelming and indescribable shoots somewhere between the cerebellum and the brainstem, causing me to jump up and run to the kids' bathroom, and I am instantly reminded of that other reason not to go there. The bright colors everywhere, including a girl before a mirror Picasso shower curtain, which causes me to have eye spasms and have kaleidoscope vision. Next time, I think, as I fall next to the toilet, don't call God out. Getting sick is a violent, shameful exercise. And I'm fairly sure that some of my soul and a couple of ribs may get lost in the process. The one positive of retching is that afterward I can fall back into bed and die or pass out, whichever comes first. So far it has only been passing out, even though I have requested death every time and have been rejected, ergo. Although I once had a conversation with Richard Nixon, he knew everything. I'm also reminded... Why my wife yells at my son for not wiping the toilet after he pisses. I fall back down on the bed, feeling the pain loosen a bit, but still rolling around inside. I have one last conversation. Thanks for calling Mount Olympus, heaven, and a little nirvana in the sky for gods and goddesses, messiahs and Zeus. How may I help you?
Um, yeah. May I speak to the Chinese god this time, please? I'm sorry, but she is with someone else right now. Can I put you through to her voicemail? Um, no. How about Ra? Is Ra busy? Let me check. Look, listen. I'm just not satisfied with my current guy. But please don't tell him that. He looks great on paper and ceilings, but is a little too smitey for me. The line goes dead. And I pass out. The main floor feels the same. Shoes are strewn about. Coats are suspended over the bench. The closet door is somewhat ajar. Crafting a normal setting. Too normal. Which is even more surprising, having traveled so far into such otherworldly dimensions, including whatever you call Hades, Hale, Samsara, Shimbot Bridge. While as I make my way through the usual jungle of houseplants, they are fake, just like everything else in this house. My kids make no notice or attempt to address me when I appear in the family room. They had no problem speaking when I lay dying in anguish upstairs, even when the slightest noise brought me to another step closer to death. Yet now they are speechless. Jasmine doesn't look up from her phone. A crumpled McDonald's sack sits on her stomach. The boy rests on the floor with his head in his hand, watching a reality show about bikers. He does acknowledge his father finally with a head bob, the aloha for teen boys, but turns back to his show immediately. No, how are you, or how are you feeling? I'll take the head nod. Were you watching Telemundo earlier, I ask? The sound of my voice shocks me. It hasn't changed either. He gives me a strange look and shakes his head. I walk through the family room into the kitchen to find Suzanne mixing eggs. Feels like hours ago when she asked if I wanted any. How long has she been making them? When she sees me, she grins, although for the record, she never stops stirring. Oh, good, she says. You're here. You okay? But I think I catch a hint of sarcasm in her tone. She is full of questions, too, like, are you hungry, honey, or do you need any aspirin? It comes off as running through the motions, and I have to remind myself that none of my agony or her aloofness is her fault. She has never been visited by such authority, and she knows I have serious medicine for my malady. Aspirin, please. If these people ever knew a tiny glimpse of what I had just been through, they would never be so obtuse. They would be carrying me to the table, wiping my head with a damp towel and offering to spoon-feed me. But even Lucy shoves her nose into my hand, looking for me to pet her as if I'd been slacking. My brain still hums and sparks like a campfire on its last legs, and I am being treated as if I had sneezed or pulled a small sliver from my finger. I've come to learn that there are others out there in the world who have known it personally as well. Millions, in fact, tucked in the shadows of everyday life. I found that it is a global institution, a sort of hidden community, held together by a shared experience rather than a geography. They compare notes and discuss what helps and what doesn't, usually upon an accidental discovery of brotherhood or sisterhood, but soon find themselves disappointed from the hope they can learn of some trick they have not yet tried. It's nice that others understand, though. I sit down at the kitchen table with what I assume is the look of someone who's just witnessed a murder because, well, I almost did. My wife sets down a plate of eggs and toast in front of me, then rubs the back of my head softly for a few seconds. She then presses her hand against my face. I admit it makes me feel a little better. I need to accept the fact that the family has grown immune to my suffering as a device for their own survival. It's simple Darwinism, and it would do them no good to endure the agony with me every time. They have lives, too. But all I ask for is the acknowledgement that I have been through something more traumatic than just a headache. I take a bite of the scrambled eggs. My jaw and teeth are sore, so I chew lightly. I am still drowsy, and I wear the aura around me like a cloud, or at least in my mind. The wretchedness could come back at any second just by making a sudden or jerky move, so I act deliber deliberately. The orange juice helps rid my mouth of some of the evil that the toothbrushing in one and a half showers could not. I straighten and bend my legs several times to loosen my knees and joints. My coordination is still a bit off, and I find myself eating so close to the plate of eggs that the steam hits against the skin of my face. I take long, thoughtful breaths in between bites, making sure I am oxygenating correctly. My wife refills my orange juice and walks out of the kitchen. Something did occur. I did almost cease living. 
I feel like mentioning that every time she comes back into the kitchen, but I refrain from doing so. She returns with dirty glasses from the family room, acting abnormally busier than usual. Maybe to make the point that she is a single parent whenever I go out of service like this. She even asks our daughter if she'd finished her homework, something I usually do, and then tells our son he needs to get a ride home from school the next day because she has too much going on from work. I feel throbbing in the back of my head. I want to say things. I, you know, I get it. I'm sorry for my migraines are so hard on you. When Suzanne comes to get my plate, I decide to add something to the conversation. Hey, uh... It got ugly up there, and uh, I killed one of your pillows, so you'll probably need to buy a new one. Her smile turns into a chuckle, and she shakes her head. I lift my juice and shrug, just saying. Suzanne mothers mutters something at me like, good job. Or maybe it was, get a better job. She walks back over and leans up against me. She moves my bangs to the side, then rumps her fingers through my hair. I close my eyes and hear the terrible yelps of Charlotte, the trapeze swinger. I open my eyes to find Suzanne staring into my eyes. She walks back over to the sink and rinses out her egg mixing bowl. My chest fills with air. I drag myself over to her and hand her my plate, then rest my head on her shoulder. Emotions fill me, and I feel like crying. She wraps her hands around me, tenderly caresses my neck and back, taking me into her like a child. I tell her, I'm sorry about the pillow.